Ready? Yes, okay. I'm ready. All right, uh, Clerk Moscow, are you ready? I am ready. Excellent. Then at this time, I will call to order the regularly scheduled community meeting for the Village of Midlothian, Wednesday, October 21st, 2020, at 7 p.m. Roll call, please, Clerk Moscow. Trustee Kamey? Here. Trustee Crowley? Here. Trustee Gilbus? Here. Trustee Ivan? Here. Trustee Killily? Trustee Kreis? Here. Mayor Brew? Here. You have a quorum. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, at this time, I declare that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent because of the coronavirus pandemic. And Mayor, I have verified that we have a quorum uh, confirmed by audio or visual confirmation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Deputy Clerk Kalaki, was there any comment from the public? No, there was not. Thank you. Uh, and if it pleases the board, uh, we have a guest here tonight, Aldo, uh, from uh, Horton. Right? From Horton, right? Yes. Okay. And we'd like to discuss uh, the health insurance renewal. So if it pleases the board, we'll have Trustee Ivan go first. I'll try not to uh, pass you over, Trustee Kreis. So I'll try to get back to you first thing. Trustee Ivan. Well, I, I'd like to make the, uh, uh, well, thank you, Mayor, first. And then I want to turn over the uh, my agenda item on the insurance over to uh, Trustee Crowley. It's yours, Trustee. Well, thank you. Um, as everyone knows, we've had a insurance committee meetings for the last few months going over the options um, that uh, the village has been presented by Horton. And I know Aldo's going to talk a little bit about those options in a few minutes and what they mean as far as cost and benefits to the uh, village employees. We did last week have a uh, ask everybody on the committee to send Maggie their recommendation, which policy they uh, feel would be the best for the village. And it's my understanding that the policy that came that was chosen overall was the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, tiered. I'm going to say it wrong, Eldo. What is it called? Blue Choice Options. Thank you. The blue choice options which he's going to talk about um i did see i have not had a chance to read it yet that there was um, an email late this afternoon <clears throat> from someone regarding the insurance um i haven't had a chance to read it yet so i will look at that um but as of yesterday the vote was for uh keeping blue cross blue shield not going to united healthcare and going with the blue choice tiered program which has uh, savings for the village, the employees, and additional benefits. So with all that said, Aldo, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor, Trustees, good evening. Um, thanks for your time and attention this evening. Um, everyone should have a copy of the exhibit, um, which I believe Maggie sent out uh, Monday. So beginning on page two of that exhibit, um, just to remind the committee, uh, we did approach all of the different um, medical carriers available. Uh, two declined, that would be Aetna and Cigna. Humana and United Healthcare, of, co of course, quoted, and Blue Cross was our incumbent. Um, given the decision and uh, decision from the majority, I'm going to focus my attention on the Blue Cross renewal and the options presented by Blue Cross. So if you go to page three of the marketing spreadsheet. This, excuse me, Aldo, are we looking at the spreadsheet that also has comments in it and red boxes? Correct. Okay, thank you. And I did that just to help identify what were the major changes, uh, what's the overall impact and or benefit to the village and its employees. So, oh, no, I appreciate that. 
So referencing page three of the exhibit, um, the left-hand side shows our current programs with Blue Cross Blue Shield. That's five programs that are made up of one HMO plan, uh, three PPO plans, uh, one $1,000 deductible, one $1,500 deductible, and a $3,500 deductible PPO, and then finally a $2,700 HSA. Currently, we're paying a total premium of $1,232,752. The initial rate action that Blue Cross um, proposed was an increase of 9.84%. That's an increase of $121,347, bringing our overall premium up to $1,354,099. Now, the only change here would be to the HSA plan increasing its individual and family deductibles to maintain compliance with IRS regulations for an embedded deductible. Um, otherwise, nothing else changes within our plans. And this should actually ref reflect renewal premiums effective 12-1, not 1-1. So my apologies there. Going to the next page, Page four, this reflects our renegotiated uh, renewal with Blue Cross. Again, if we made no plan changes whatsoever, Blue Cross has agreed to a rate action of 3.25 over our current rates. That brings our overall increase to $40,100 total premium of $1,272,852. Now, we were attempting to get as aggressive as we could with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Unfortunately, they couldn't provide us any additional rate concessions, but what they did offer to do was provide us with a one-time credit of $30,000, which would be applied in the second or third month, it's generally the third month following our anniversary. So we could expect that $30,000 credit to apply in our March statement. Accounting for that $30,000 credit, our rate action actually goes down to 0.82% over current rates, equivalent to $1,242,852. Again, this is not making any changes whatsoever to our program. And Aldo, what, Aldo what's the difference in the rate uh, in, the in the final number of the rate to the village? Um, so the overall premium would be 3.25, if, if I'm hearing you correctly. Is that, is that what you're looking for? The dollar amount after the $30,000 credit. Uh, one million two hundred forty-two thousand eight hundred fifty-two. And that's a difference between what we're currently paying of. Sorry, I don't have it written down here. Oh yeah, let, we didn't factor that out. Let me get that for you. Just that's so great. the board knows, with the, I mean, I, I mean, everybody can add and subtract, but just so it's clear. Yeah, absolutely. What, what what the difference is? It'll take me one second here. difference of $10,100 approximately. Thank you. Over current. Any other questions so far? Great. Going to page five or the following page. This is where we proposed a minor change to the program. The change would reflect eliminating the $1,500 PPO that we currently have in place and replacing it with a two-tiered PPO plan. This two-tiered plan has two distinct levels of in-network benefits based on the providers that I'm using. So tier one would utilize Blue Choice Options providers. If I stay within this tier, I still have the same $1,500 individual deductible and the same $4,500 family deductible. 
You'll note, however, that there are some improvements to this tier. My coinsurance would go from 80% up to 90%, which ultimately reduces an employee's out-of-pocket exposure by 10%. My individual out-of-pocket maximum remains the same at $3,000 per individual and $9,000 for a family. So to refresh everyone's memory, if I go into a hospital type setting, I'm still responsible for my deductible. Once I've satisfied that deductible, I'm responsible for 10%, 10% of all remaining charges, up to a maximum of $3,000 on an individual basis. So this $3,000 individual out of pocket maximum is inclusive It's my worst case scenario. It's inclusive of deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance. Now, there are some differences that aren't positive. Going down the line, you'll see that the emergency room co-pay does increase to $400 from $150. However, it's $400 then 10% co-insurance to the member. Currently, it's $150 copay per occurrence, then 80% after your deductible. So your deductible is applicable under the current program. I'm sorry, $1,500. Um, going to the hospital copay, that would change to. Is there a question? No. Okay. Under the hospital copay, I'd be responsible for a $250 copay per occurrence, the 90%, that's currently at 80% after the deductible. The other change, which would apply to both plans, has to do with prescription drugs. However, before we go into the drug copays, one of the major changes between these two plans is that under this proposed Blue Choice Options plan, my individual and family out of pocket are inclusive of prescription drugs. That's a big change from our existing plan because if you'll look under the current $1,500 plan, there's also a separate $1,000 individual out of pocket along with a $3,000 family out of pocket. So realistically, worst case scenario, if I had a catastrophic accident or a very severe chronic condition, my total out-of-pocket expense would be my $3,000, I'm sorry, my $4,500 out-of-pocket maximum plus my $1,000 prescription drug out-of-pocket maximum for a total of $5,500. Under this proposed Blue Choice Options plan, my worst case scenario is $3,000 on an individual basis. Question so far? Okay. Sounds good. Now, there is a change to the prescription drug copays. Um, they, there are two distinct levels of benefits um, dictated on whether I'm accessing a preferred pharmacy or a non preferred pharmacy. So currently, where we have a four-tiered drug card, generic, preferred, non-preferred, and specialty, I'm now going to go to zero or ten dollars for generic, thirty-five or seventy-five for preferred, and then one fifty or two fifty for non-preferred medication and specialty drugs. And yeah. Uh, right, Aldo, is that on all blue, both blue clocks? That's on both tiers. So the prescription drug copays um, apply to both tiers as we're talking about now. And does that also um, apply to both the blue choice and the, the original policy or just the new policy? No, this is only for the proposed blue choice options plan. If we made no changes, we would keep our current four-tier drug card, which is 835-7575. And the new one is what? Um, it's either 010, 3575, 150, or 250, if we go to a preferred pharmacy, or it's 1020, 
for a non-preferred pharmacy. So you'll see that the, ver the, the big changes really have to do with generic and brand name medications. Specialty and non-preferred brand name drugs really still have the same co-pays on the back end. Any other questions so far? So the other change will apply to routine office visits. So under the tiered one structure, they remain at 30 or $50. The big change will apply with tier two. So let's go to tier two. Again, tier one is utilizing a blue choice options provider. Tier two makes up the balance of our current PPO program. So collectively, tier one and tier two make up our existing PPO network that we utilize today. Now under tier two, I have a $3,500 individual deductible or 10,200 for a family. Now, let me pause there for a moment. There is what's called um, carryover between what we call accumulators. Accumulators are your deductible and your out-of-pocket maximums. What that simply means is that if I satisfy my individual deductible under tier two, and I, under tier one, I satisfy my individual deductible under tier one and decide that I'm, a, I'm going to access a tier two provider, that $1,500 deductible will carry over into tier two, which means I'm only responsible for the difference under tier two between the tier one deductible of $1,500 and the $3,500 tier two deductible. So realistically, I'm only responsible for an additional $200 individually. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Perfect. So going into co-insurance, again, I've satisfied my deductible under tier two. I go into co-insurance. I'm responsible for 30%, 30% up to $5,500 on an individual basis or $10,200 for a family. Again, just to reiterate, similar to the deductible expense under tier two, the out-of-pocket maximum also has carryover between tier one and tier two and vice versa. So again, if I satisfy my, my medical out-of-pocket maximum of 3,000 under tier one, go to tier two, I only have an additional $2,500 medical maximum out-of-pocket to incur. Everyone following so far? Yes. Wonderful. I, I recognize this plan can be a little bit complicated to follow at times. Um, our emergency room copay remains the same as tier one. However, our hospitalization copay does go up under tier two. That now becomes $500 per occurrence, then 30% to the member. Our office visit copays do increase for primary care physicians up to $50 and up to $100 for a specialist. Telehealth services remains at $30 for um, that telehealth copay. Any questions? Now, the big whammy is that there are, again, significant savings to be gained by moving to this program. With the revised renewal and accounting for the change in this program, we actually end up at minus 1.29% from our current rates. So that's equivalent to a savings of $16,000 approximately over our current rates. With the $30,000 credit that Blue Cross is providing us, that gets us down to annualized premium of $1,186,789. It's a decrease of 3.73% from our current rates, the savings, Trustee Crowley, because uh, I know you like this question, is going to be almost $46,000 in savings from our current plan. And 
one of the options that we talked about, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you finishing? No, 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 please, please, trustee, go, go ahead. One of the options that we talked about, because there you know, would not be an increase in this plan, um, and there would be a um, decrease to the village, that what a lot of municipalities are doing is actually um, uh, having a divided uh, savings so that the village saves their 80% and their employees split the 20% that they pay into the to the plan, giving them additional savings. Is that how it, correct? Did I say that correctly? When it comes to the savings. Correct. The options we discussed. Correct. So in addition to um, the benefits, they would the our employees could also, um, with the board agreeing to it, the employees could receive a twenty percent, uh, twenty percent of our overall savings towards their portion of their insurance, which would be additional savings to them. I think that's a great idea. So, so there is one thing that I do want to point out because again. Um, there is a slight difference in the networks between blue choice options and our traditional PPO under tier two. So there are some excluded hospitals um, under tier one, specifically Children's Hospital downtown, um, the North Shore University Health System, um, that would be Evanston and Glenbrook Hospital, um, Highland Park Hospital, the big one that we feel may potentially um, cause some disruption is Ingalls, which is also excluded from tier one, but is still part of tier two under the traditional PPO program. And it's excluded because University of Chicago is also, is also excluded and Ingalls is owned by U of C. Um, so those two are also excluded from tier one, but again, are part of tier two. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Is, which is the more premier policy, tier one or tier two? So they're, they're the same. It, the difference is, again, the network. So as I mentioned at, at the top of our meeting, tier two specifically utilizes blue choice options providers those systems that are excluded from tier one are considered part of the regular PPO program under tier two. So collectively, they make up our current PPO network. Does that answer your question? Um, no, I'm so confused. I'm sorry. So those that are excluded <laughs> under okay. tier one? No, you, you don't have to go into it. So no, no, and, and it's okay. Simply, simply put, those that are excluded under tier one are part of tier two. Tier two is equivalent to our current PPO network. Right, but if you, but if one of our employees decides they're going to take tier one instead of tier two, they're excluded from Children's Hospital and Eagles. No, they can't. They're not excluded. No, no, they're not excluded. So you're not choosing one or the other. You have they're access both. to both. So simply put, if so, for example, my kids go to Children's. If my kids went to Children's. I could still choose to go to children's, they would simply be covered under tier two benefits, not tier one benefits. Okay. It's the same policy. What they're doing is they're giving you additional discounts for using their preferred. Right. Which is tier, tier one. one. Right. Correct. All right, I see. Um, the other thing to point out is um, for children, for kids that may be away at college, or even for our retirees, they would fall under tier one benefits, even if they're not accessing a BCO provider or a blue choice options provider. So anyone that's out of state by default would receive tier one benefits. Excellent. Any other questions? That's all I really have at I, this point. Uh, very, thank actually, you so much for uh, everything you've done, Aldo. That, that's incredible news. I, thank you. I do have a question, Aldo. Yes. So the other, the other two PPOs that are on either that bookend this, they're still available. They would still be available as well. Correct. All we're doing is replacing our existing $1,500 PPO with this okay. Blue Choice Options plan. 
We would still offer five plans, our current HMO, our current $1,000 deductible, our current $3,500 deductible PPO, and our $2,800 HSA. Wow. All right. Well, uh, yes. can, can, I, can I ask if any of the board wants to uh, go over United? Uh, of course. Healthcare, why we didn't? No. Why we didn't? Choose them. Aldo already told us. Why did he switch? I'm sorry. Uh, 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 let me let the record show that uh, Tracy Killey is in attendance uh, via Zoom. Right. Thank you. So, okay. Thank you. All right. Excellent work. So what's the next step? Uh, we got to put on the uh, agenda for approval. Or? Well, I, Trustee Kelly, I'm glad you're here. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is we did have our last meeting. If I think you'll agree, Don. We had our last meeting um, last Thursday, I believe it was. Um, yes. And we had, I think, a number of people respond and make the recommendation of the this new blue choice. But I do, I think... I was looking over, I was trying to look at some of my emails where we were talking and um, I do think there's some questions that a couple more people have for Aldo. So I'd be fine with putting it on the agenda for a vote next week. Um, if Aldo, you could answer those last few questions, make sure there's no more and then reply, Maggie could send it to the, the replies and the questions to the whole board. It would be my pleasure. Are you okay with that, Don? Yes. Outstanding. Outstanding work, all of you. And I have to say, although you have been absolutely amazing during this process, um, I know we ask a lot with when it comes to easy spreadsheets and, and cheat sheets, and anybody who's ever dealt with insurance, I'm sure, realizes that's not easy to do, but I really think you nailed it this time um, and really got us the simplistic answers to some of these complex questions. So thank you for the kind, thank you for the kind words. We, uh, Mike, myself and our team recognize, um, how challenging this could be. Um, and our job is to try to simplify this as much as possible. It's been our absolute pleasure working with you and your committee. And, uh, we really thank you for, um, the opportunity. Can I just get, ask another question? I'm sorry. Um, how much of an appetite do you think there will be for the new, um, the tier one, tier two PPL? And was it, um, and was there an emphasis on um, the HSA and the benefits to an employee, the whole thing about um, that, that, that money that they don't spend could kind of you know, grow into like a mini retirement account? I'm just wondering um, if there was a push to really add, and are we going to educate the employees on that? So I can, if, I, I know you have a lot to say about that, Aldo, but if, if I could say one thing about that during our committee and Don chime in. Um, one of the things, Karen, that I do think that the village needs to look at, um, we've talked about the, um, the HSA plan a number of times, um, and we do only have a few uh, employees who take advantage of it. Yeah, but, okay. But unfortunately, it seems, and I'm going to try and say this delicately, that the village does not um, really make it um, appealing for employees to take advantage of this by their portion of what they put into the HSA. And that is something that we have talked about at the committee meetings on what we could do differently to increase that. But I really think that's going to fall on us to make it a more of an appealing insurance to be able to, um, to 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 show that the employees that it would be more beneficial. Aldo? Thanks. So part of our communication strategy at open enrollment will include um, really educating all of our employees of all the different plans and the distinctions between each plan. Um, to, tr to Trustee Crowley's point, um, I think in order to have successful enrollment under the $2,800 high deductible health plan that's HSA compliant, I think the big motivating factor in steering employees in that direction is 
for them to receive some type of contribution towards their HSA accounts. As you know, as you may know, HSAs are individually owned accounts to employees, and we generally see an increase in enrollment in those types of plans when there is some type of employer contribution. Um, but again, we, we will work with Maggie in putting together an effective communication strategy so that employees can continue to understand the differences between all the plans, but especially since we are implementing, potentially implementing this Blue Choice Options PPO, which as, as we know, can be a little confusing. Oh, if I can say something, I think one of the problems is there's not a lot of savings and the premium between the two plans. So I don't know where the money is going to come in for the, uh, the village does kick in money now, but there's, you know, only, it looks like only a 10% roughly difference, or am I looking at, no, maybe, yeah, about a 10% difference, is that, or if I can't read right, I think I can read. Uh, so there's not that much money and savings for the uh, village to kick in. And right now, if you looked at it for an individual, individual they would save like $50 a month and with a $2,500 deductible. That might be perceived as a good deal because we would kick in some money up front, but it, it's kind of hard to, for the village to give uh, to uh, give more money as an incentive in that uh, type of scenario. Right. Understood. Um, absolutely, and, and we understand the challenges with uh, the current contribution schedules and the distinction between uh, the premiums across each plan and each tier. Um, that definitely plays a role in creating steerage into the high deductible health plan. Um, I mean, currently there, to your point, there's not much of a monetary incentive to, to really move between plans. It really becomes what is a member's or an employee's respective situation, either financially or from a health perspective, to choose any given plan that they're electing. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Um, I'll just say a for me. that the, um, the committee was made up of representatives from every department, um, the department head or his, de his or her designee, and uh, uh, any other member who wanted to be a part were included in the discussions and were allowed to participate. So I just wanted to make the board aware of that. All right. Well, thank you so and much. And we got some great questions. Thank you so much, Otto, and, and the committee. Um, and uh, thank you for spending part of your evening with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Otto. Take care. Bye-bye. So, Deputy Clerk Kalaki, uh, that will be on the agenda for approval next week. Yes, I'll make sure it is. All right. Anything else, Trustee Ivan? Uh, just a few little things. Um, I had the uh, finance department in front of the office uh, put together uh, some stats on how many transactions we've done and what types of transactions that we've done. Uh, instead of boring you guys with the specific numbers, I uh, will send you an email uh, with, their, with the numbers um, so that you can dissect it at leisure. I also want to know, let you know that uh, since we shut down the water, I mean, since we put in the plan for shutting off water for non-payment. It started in September. Um, we have now 50 residents that have opted out to sign up for payment plans to uh, play catch up with the um, with payments that they did not make when we were uh, letting that, um, well, when we were granting the residents an extension on their payments. Um, that is it for me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, man. All right. Let's go back to the top. Trustee Price. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the, uh, the item that I have on the agenda is the review in the approval of the intergovernmental agreement with Phase 2 Engineering through the Illinois Transportation Enhancement Program for the Natalie Creek Trail. And I would like to make a motion to approve the intergovernmental agreement. Is there a second? A second. Uh, any discussion? Okay, roll call please, Clerk Moscow. Trustee Kreis. Aye. Trustee Gillis. Aye. Trustee Caveney. Aye. Trustee Crowley. 
Aye. Trustee Ivan. Nay. Trustee Killily. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, um, thank you all. And Mayor, I am working on filling out, I, I was on a, a lengthy webinar today for ITEP. Um, it has to be submitted by November 2nd and you have to submit it electronically and you have to mail a hard copy with original signatures to the Springfield IDOT office. So I'm working on getting the forms filled out that require your signature so we can get the original signatures um, in time. And also we are going to need, I found out today, a resolution with the intergovernmental agreement. So could I ask for the clerk's office assistance in putting together a resolution to go with the IGA and have it on the agenda next week and I can get you wording for that. Yes, if you can get us wording, we'll get that together, Trustee. Okay. So thank you all. All right. Uh, just to let you know, I did speak with uh, Representative Will Davis to encourage him to sign a letter of support for this. So, and it appears that he is. Did you get one? He is, yes. All of, all of the letters of support are being worked on right now. Oh, and Mayor, I need one from you as well. Uh-oh. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I have, I have a very large to-do list on this grant. Right. And right now my focus is on the phase two engineering, and I'm hoping to get time to work on the construction portion grant, but I don't know if I'll have time to pull that together. Can you send me a... I uh, can get you, give version. me a little bit of time, and I can get you some wording, okay? Or just uh, one of the other letters of support to uh, try to be on the same page with all the other support letters. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll get you some language, okay? Thank you. And that's all I have. Trustee Gillis, thank you, ma'am. Trustee Gillis. I have nothing. Thank you, sir. Trustee Saveney. Thank you, Mayor. I have this evening for our review the uh, new zoning map. As you are aware, the village is required to update its zoning map every year, sometime in March or April, but due to COVID and with things being slowed down, um, we were not able to do it then because we were supposed to have a couple of uh, zoning chain, zoning board of appeal meetings to update some zoning and those weren't held until um, later on in the summer. So this is the new map. That's a nice map, Mayor. I do, I do have a question though. Um, if you look on the map, um, I don't know if I can, Low mine if I can make mine bigger on my computer screen. If you look um, on the map around at 147th Street, actually, um, I'm looking at I'm at 147th Street over uh, by Kilbourne between Kilbourne and Costner. You can see um, the Moran Building and the Mighty Key Muffler Shop are in pink. And behind, just north of those buildings, you can see a bunch of green space. I believe that green space is the new um, MWRD retention pond. That is correct. But, but it looks like there's still half of the street going through it. Uh, the whole thing should be green, and it's not. We will have to look in to see if that is part of Kenneth that we'll have to vacate, yes. How did that not get caught when MWD was doing the land acquisition? I have no idea. <laughs> Karen? You know, they they picked up a number through the land bank. They picked up a number of those pins. And then I think they had to go to court to pick up a couple because there was a, or, or to pick up one, there was a structure on one. Right. Yes. It was a, you know what? The structure was, uh, it was like a shed. The, the yeah. garage. The storage garage. Right. right or garage, yeah. So I am just wondering But if you if, if you look really close, it looks like half of it looks like half of uh, there's a small sliver of 146th Street that's still there. It's next to that residential lot that's that's zigzaggy residential lot, you see? And then that little sliver of Kenneth, but it's not even a whole width of the street, it's just a sliver. 
So could that be like right away? That I'm wondering if something didn't get recorded properly. I, I don't know. That's got. I don't be. know. That, that's kind of odd for that to be there. Quite frankly, I'm totally shocked that I even noticed that. Me too. Me too. I'm totally. I am not. <laughs> I'll ask. Uh, uh, Superintendent Weiner about that. All right. Yeah. Anything else? I forgot to ask him about it the other day when he sent it to me. But I, I, so I just wanted to bring that up that we, you know, before before I put this on the agenda next week for approval, we need to look into this because I thought that that was all land that the MWRD amassed for the project. So. Okay. And if they're still waiting on something, if we need to wait because of some legal, whatever, that can wait till next year. But I just wanted to make sure that I brought this up. Well, they wouldn't, MWRD wouldn't have moved forward with the project until they had all the property. They couldn't have without okay. all the pins. Right. But, okay. So, again, I don't know, like you said, I don't know if something got recorded wrong or if a legal description is wrong or what happened. Or if those are, like you said, Mayor, if those are parts of right-of-ways of streets that have to be vacated. Or an alley. Looks more like an alley. But yeah. I'll, I'll find out before next okay. week. I got it on my to-do list. Okay, very good. Also, um, just so you're aware, I, I, I'm going to have to rattle a cage over at MWRD. I reached out to... Um, I wasn't sure if... Uh, who were the two original engineers, Karen? Um, Cedric. Cedric, Cedric and, and Joe Praxer. So I reached I reached out to Cedric and Joe and Klaus Dunkelberg. Um, Joe Joe suggested I reached out to Joe Sperry first. He responded and he copied Klaus Dunkelberg and the new MWRD engineer. There's a new gentleman who's taken over the project. I don't recall his name. Kasha, Kasha. Yes. Um, there were a couple of residents I talked to that had some questions. So I sent them an email, and I must have sent this email back like in July. I sent them an email. They didn't respond. Two weeks later, I sent them a follow-up. Oh, we're sorry. We'll look at it. We'll get back to you. Two weeks later, three weeks later, I followed up again. Oh, Klaus is on vacation. We'll get back to you. I followed up again. He, he answered something to me, but he didn't even answer my question. It was like he was answering somebody else's question in my email. And I've still not heard back from them. So I'm going to get in touch with them tomorrow and um, have to be a little stern. What was the question? I don't even remember now. <laughs> oh, I know what it was. <laughs> on Chris Parker Street on Colmar, uh, first of all, the, um, the uh, landscaper who was hired to install the plants, the new plantings along the creek there, and also along um, the creek uh, on Allen's Block on uh, Kilpatrick. The, they left a mess. They didn't leave a mess on Kilpatrick. They left a mess on um, Colmar. Like, I mean, like they left a trashy mess. They left a pile of the plastic containers that the plants come in. They left a big heaping pile of trash on the bank of the creek. Plus, there was an issue, and we took pictures and sent pictures in. It looked as though there was already some erosion happening at the foot of Jamie's driveway. So we sent them some questions with regards to that. And they've not gotten back to us. So, and Joe, Joe was included in these emails. So it's unusual. I, I know it is. I know it is. So I'm, I'm just letting you know that this has occurred. So I'm going to be reaching out to them tomorrow or Friday. So I wonder, it, it sounds like they just need to tell their contractor to whoever they hired to clean up what, the mess well, thing. sure, sure. I mean, and that's kind of the secondary problem. That wasn't even the main problem. The main problem was some of the new riprap, you know, stuff that's on the bank of the creek was, it looked like there was some, um, uh, some, some of the stuff was washing away. So, you know, that, that's what the, that was the more critical question and no one's gotten back to me yet, so. Let us know what you find out and let me know if you need my help. I will. I think when I reach out to the, them again, I'm going to copy you. Thank you. Anything else tonight? Um, oh, one, one quick thing. Um, our Rain Ready Community Garden looks lovely. 
we have 14 scarecrows installed already and we have nine that are coming so hopefully by you know friday by the end of day friday we will have a total of 23 scarecrows which i'm very excited about considering we we got a little bit of a late start on this project because we weren't sure if we were going to be doing halloween and trick-or-treating and all that stuff so um, i did get out to the community rather late so I do want to um, thank everyone who is participating. The, the rain garden looks very, very nice. Um, I'll be out there again on Friday helping a few people install their scarecrows, and I'll get through the, um, the gardens and stuff and pick up the trash and everything. And we've got 50 pumpkins. We'll have 50 brand-new spray-painted kindness rocks to give away and 50 treat bags. So I hope 50 children show up on Sunday to take all this stuff home with them. And I hope all of our village employees and our board shows up as well. It's very, very nice. Also, Nick had told me, Superintendent Weiner told me that the uh, building department process, they received an unusually high number of permit applications in September, mostly due to the, the storm that we had. I believe he told me they received about 169 permit applications. And usually in September, it's you know under 100. So they've been extremely busy with processing applications. So they're working diligently to get through all of that for all of our residents who have storm damage that needs to be repaired. Also, for any of our residents who are listening, I do want to remind everyone that the village has agreed to waive the permit fee for any permit application for work that is necessary due in order to correct storm damage. But you do still need to apply for a permit. Just because we're not charging a fee does not mean you don't need the permit. So please make sure you reach out to the village if you're not sure. Please contact the building department and they will be able to confirm for you. That's all I have right now. Thank you, ma'am. Trustee Cooley? Um, one quick thing, Mayor. Uh, tomorrow's a uh, South Suburban Lane Bank meeting and it reminded me of two things. One is, uh, Trustee Kevin, I gave you uh, wrong information when you asked a couple months ago. You asked about any land bank properties, and I said there weren't any in town, and I was wrong. There's still one uh, executive car wash next to Custom 77, and there's no uh, no bites on that at all. Custom 77 doesn't want to acquire the property at this time, so let's see if anything goes on. Also, I, I just want, uh, you know, the revenue stream for the land bank for right now definitely is going to be uh, abandoned properties. And we've done very well with abandoned properties for the village. The land bank has sold them and uh, got them back up on the tax rolls. Uh, but it also brings money, of course, into the land bank. So I, I just want to remind, remind ourselves that if there's anything that's an abandoned property, or property, maybe a rental property that hasn't been doing anything for a long time, then maybe we can try to have the land bank acquire them as a abandoned property, and uh, again get them revenue, get the get a new owner, so we get it back on our tax rolls too. And that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Trustee Crowley. Uh, just a couple things tonight, sir. First, um, I just wanted to thank the CPC for. Uh, replenishing all of our we call police signs. I've a lot of people come in requesting them, and they have restocked the shelves uh, at the police department. So thank you to them. And one last announcement: um, on November 14th, the police department will be holding their first youth academy. Um, they are right now have 14 students from Bremen High School's Criminal Justice and Law. Uh, programs coming in to do a one-day, eight-hour youth academy. So it'll be our first, and, we're and I know they're looking forward to it, and they've put a lot of work and effort into it. So I will keep everybody posted, but we're really excited about it. Thank you. Anything else? That's all I have tonight. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Attorney Valdez. You're on mute. <laughs> He's in the other room. Okay, um, first item that we have uh, under my report is the draft ordinance for the adult use cannabis occupational tax. Uh, this tax is the local share that was authorized by the General Assembly when they enacted the adult use cannabis uh, law. And so, uh, as you may remember, Trustee uh, Killey and I discussed 
uh, and reviewed other actions by other municipalities in setting that tax rate, probably 90% of municipalities set it at the full maximum 3%. A handful have gone lower than that. Uh, we believe that uh, in order to provide an incentive to get a dispensary, uh, which would more than uh, make up for what the loss would be uh, in terms of income coming in from uh, retail tax on cannabis, that it would be set it to uh, the law says that it may be maximized at three and it must be in quarter percent intervals. It is the board's pleasure as to what the number will be. Uh, and then the last item that I have is uh, coming up in January, uh, we will, or before the end of this year, we are required to do uh, village wide sexual harassment training. That is a requirement uh, of them of Midlothian. And so uh, we will have to address that to make sure that every employee has been trained uh, with regard to the law under sexual harassment uh, in the state of all. That's all I have. Nick, is that, um, is that every year they have to have a training or is that a one-time training? Uh, I believe it is a one-time training, but new employees would have to be trained at ongoing. And I, I, will, I think I just, I, I'm pretty sure I, I was just looking at the courses or the um, classes that our insurance carrier does, mm -hmm. and I believe that's one of them that they offer yeah. for no charge. And that's what I think would have to do. Essentially, what this requirement is, is that we have something to prove that every employee has been trained. So that's what we're looking for is some entity that could provide right. it. A certificate. Yeah. It's on our insurance. It's our provider on our provider list from our insurance carrier as yeah. one of the classes. We, we did that for the village about six years ago, and and uh, one of the attorneys came in and did uh, the instructions very good, and then you know helped helped a lot. Got some questions, and also at the end of the course, they used, she gave us a certificate of uh, completion. So I think that's uh, that's what you're looking for, Attorney Galvez. Yes. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that uh, Treasurer Britton at a staff meeting a month or two ago had given all the department heads or emailed them all a link Correct. to an online course that everyone's supposed to take. And I spoke to Superintendent Weiner the other day and I asked him to please ask the building department employees to have it done by the end of November. Right. So we have six weeks to get proof that that has occurred for every employee. Okay. We'll make it happen. That's it. All right. Mayor, if I could, one thing I forgot to mention during my business, I Sorry, do want to remind everybody that this Saturday is the trunk or treat at the Park District from 10 o'clock till noon at the um, new facility at 145th and Costner. And also the village will be hosting its annual Fall Fest and Scarecrow display on Sunday from noon to 1.30. Now are you done? I'm done. All right. Uh, the only thing I have under my business, we're going to make it, make another go at this. Um, hopefully, we got all our ducks in a row this time. But uh, this is the uh, ordinance that is mandatory to uh, convene the joint review board and to call a public hearing for the uh, new tip. So at this time, I'm looking for a motion. To approve Ordinance 2065, proposing the designation of a redevelopment plan and project for the designation of the downtown TIF district number two and the adoption of the tax increment allocation financing, therefore, convening a joint review board and calling a public hearing in connection therewith. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Is there any discussion? The, the only question I have is that the ordinance references two exhibits. And neither were attached. Uh, well, we can get those, but that's not yeah. good. Attorney. Yes, the the exhibits are the plan that has previously been issued to the board. The only thing that changed was the dates for the uh, public hearing and the uh, joint review. Everything else is exactly the same. And I believe the second exhibit. Um, do you know what the second exhibit was, Trustee? Was it the legal? 
Uh, Everything's the same as the last time we approved it. No, it was a sample. It was a sample of the public notice, trustee. Okay, so the two, okay. the two exhibits. First one is the is the actual plan, the public plan that each trustee has. The only thing that changed was the dates date. for the uh, meetings, and the second item was the notice that goes into the newspaper for the clerk to uh, alert the public. Which is the same okay, as the last yeah. time. Same on that. And I had one question too. Yes, ma'am. Well, could I just ask, could we get a copy of the Exhibit A with the revised date? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And then I just had one question. Um, the map is still the same map, no changes have been made? We had to do some uh, negotiations and uh, Springfield School on Springfield Avenue got included into the TIF. No deletions, I guess I'll ask then. No what? No deletions in property or areas? Correct. No. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. All right. Uh, then I'm looking for a roll call vote there, Clerk Moscow. Trustee Ivan. Aye. Trustee Caveney. Aye. Trustee Crowley. Aye. Trustee Gillis. Aye. Trustee Killily. Aye. Trustee Kreiss. Aye. Motion carries. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Look forward to seeing some of you at the Joint Review Board. Uh, that's all I have tonight. Uh, Clerk Moscow. Um, so, Mayor, I just have one item, and that is a second email that I forwarded to the board with some documentation that we received uh, after our last meeting, but from Michael Yip, who is the attorney at... Uh, what is their name? Santillas. Liston and Santillas regarding their request for a class 6B uh, for 14559 Waverly. I believe, as I included in my note, this is not the use the board thought it was going to be. And um, I promised that I would send these materials to the board for their consideration and we should give some type of response to the requester. Can I just clarify something? Initially, I was under the impression that um, the applicant was going to purchase the property, but in this letter they sent, it appears that they're just going to be renting it. Is that correct? No, I don't think so. Let's see. No, they can't. They can't apply for that if they're renting it. Right. Well, that exactly. That's what I thought. But I somewhere somewhere here in this letter. There was reference that they were going to. I think they, they referred to you. Unless, unless I misunderstood, I'll go back and reread it again. I, I read it when we received it, and I unfortunately did not make a notation on the document. Um, but I mean. They're just going to be using it, and and it also this letter keeps referencing the fact that it's vacant and unused, but it's technically not abandoned. Is that correct? Just because the property is vacant and unused does not mean it's abandoned. That is correct. No, the abandonment statute states it has to be. It, it's like two years of back taxes, and I think the taxes are current on this property. Right. So, Clerk Moscow, are you looking for... I just want to know how the board would like us to respond. That's all. It, it, well, I, I, I would just like to say, you know, I'd like to see a business in there. However, whoever owns that property is still paying the property taxes. And we would be giving a pretty substantial incentive and I don't, I don't know if it would be worth it. it. If it would be worth it for what they proposed to do, I don't know if any, anybody else feels that way. I concur. I agree as really, well. They're not really creating a whole bunch of jobs, and I agree. And, and the job they 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 promised 10, 10 jobs in the future, but there's no timeline. Six Bs are for, uh, as I think Trustee Kelly said it before, it is, it, well, Trustee Christ, it's create jobs. I mean, it's, it's right. economic development for sure, but create jobs. And that just doesn't seem like it's uh, 
worth giving up a lot for. Right. So it sounds like Clark Moscow is going to respond and tell them that the board is not interested in passing a resolution for a 6B? Correct. I, at, this, at this time, I would not be in favor. Trustee Christ says no. no. All right. I would say, yeah, it, do, it just doesn't, hit, it doesn't meet the criteria that the board considers when granting a county incentive. Right. Maybe they could bring they can, another they can give us a stronger timeline for hiring right. employees. This is the weakest application I've ever seen. Okay. Clerk Mosco, you got uh, enough information there? Yes, I do. Thank you. That's all I have. That's all you have? Uh, can, I, can I bring up one thing I just noticed? Yes. So, and I don't know if this is going to be a problem. But the Joint Review Board is scheduled to convene on Veterans Day. And I remember, the attorney can probably weigh in on this, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a federal, federal holiday. holiday. And Village Hall will be closed. And I remember we would have to reschedule other meetings because Village Hall was closed. If we had a, a, a committee meeting on a federal holiday, so I'm wondering if that is the if that if, if if legally the joint review board can convene on that day. Um that is for which one, the public hearing or the joint review? That'd be the joint That's review the first board. First meeting of the joint review board. That's the earliest we can have it, so uh Kay McKenna says that that's the earliest day we could have it. That's why we picked that day, but it could go the next day or it's all going to be by, by Zoom anyway. So. Uh, right, but then we have to, the, then the ordinance would have to be changed because it's in the ordinance. I don't, I don't know that that's going to, I don't think that's going to be a problem, but I guess we'll. Uh, but, well, if, if the board does not want to go forward with that, uh, with the joint review on Veterans Day, we can amend the ordinance to go the next day. I don't I don't have a problem doing it on Veterans Day, but I, I think what Karen's asking is, can we legally do it on Veterans exactly. Day? Exactly, exactly. No. Uh, I, would, I would say yes, but there's nothing prohibiting the, the hearing from going on uh, Veterans Day. Well, can I ask a question? Is this joint review meeting, isn't that the meeting where the schools and everybody else, all the taxing bodies participate? Yes. Are they, did they all agree to that day? No, it's not up to them to agree to the date. It's, it's up to us to provide a date. And actually, uh, you could say that it, it affords an opportunity for them to attend. What? I, I didn't see the date. What's the date they're call, they're asking for? November, November 11th. November 11th. November 11th. Under normal circumstances, a lot of people go out of town over Veterans Day because it's a holiday and people are off work. That's not yeah, but our, it's a Wednesday. It's not our. No, it's a Monday. It's a Wednesday. No, it's a Wednesday. Oh, it's a Wednesday. Yeah, I just, I just recall, and again, it was. Yep, that's right. And we couldn't do village. We couldn't do village business on a federal holiday. For the village, we couldn't do village. We couldn't have a, a committee meeting or something on a federal holiday. Well, we, I remember that we were told. We're meeting on that Wednesday, aren't we? Yes, we're having a board meeting. No, but I think it was illegal to, per, to per conduct uh, any governmental business on that holiday. I think that's what we're talking about. That's not true. I don't, if you could check it, so that, that's fine. I, yeah, I, I just want to make sure that we're legal. Argument. We could do one of two things. We can. Uh, go forward with it, which is, in my opinion, fully legal and affords all of the joint review board members to attend since they won't be in their regular uh, positions. Or we can amend it on its face uh, for the for the next day. But I would have to check with Mary Thompson to find out whether uh, she has issued those notices already to the uh, joint review board members. Let, let's stick with that date, please. Thank You're you. comfortable with it, Nick? That's fine. Gary, yes. can, 
Mayor, I'm sorry. Could you do me a favor, though? Can you make sure that we all get Zoom meetings for that hearing? Because I really do want to attend. I would me, love, all, me also. I would love to have you all attend. Yep. Is this, this? I have to go to work on Veterans Day, all right? And I'm a veteran. I always had to work on Veterans Day, and I'm not a veteran. Um, <laughs> this, these two meetings, these two meetings that are referenced in this ordinance, are these the meetings that were scheduled a long time ago but had to get canceled because somebody wasn't noticed properly? The, the Joint yes. Review Board meeting did happen, but it, we had to start the process over because uh, one entity was not notified. We never got to okay. the public hearing. Got it. There ended up being a, uh, a half a block that was within the TIF that did not get noticed, and so we had to reissue. And then okay. discussions with Springfield School, they requested that they right. be included in, so that the TIF was uh, amended to include Springfield School. Right. Okay. Anything else? Mayor, did you talk about the Halloween signs? The Halloween signs? The ones that got mailed to everyone? The ones that got mailed to everyone? Did you get mailed there? No, the one the ones are supposed to put it the people can put in front of their house, yes or no? Yeah, every, every Yeah, they, they got mailed to everyone. They got mailed to every household. I didn't get one. Oh I thought people were picking them up. There's okay. a, there's Sorry. extra ones. There's extra ones at the village uh, village hall, yes. There's a bunch of them at the village hall. I took and when I was there the other day I took photos of those and I posted them on Facebook. Yes. As well. That's why I'm confused. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you. Seeing there's no further business coming for the board, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Meeting, meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Be safe. Wear your mask. Wear your mask.